Welcome. Thank you so very much for coming today. Appreciate that. We have a jam-packed schedule in the next 55 minutes, so I want to get right to it. I want to thank all the people who came to attend. Thank you to the students. Thank you to the alumni. Thank you to the faculty. Thank you to the staff. And thank you especially to all the people who are listening to this through our live streaming on Facebook. Uh, how many people here are Thunderbird alumni? Welcome home. Nice to have you. Uh, let me introduce a couple people, and I'll get more into the ambassador's name. But uh, I'll start off introducing them. His Excellency Hen Schuer, Ambassador to the United States from the Netherlands. Uh, Gerbert Kunst is here with him. Jerome LaRoche, Piwis Pison Tang, and a special greeting to Sebe van der Zee, where are you Sebe, who is the consul for the Netherlands in Arizona, and it was his efforts that got the ambassador to come into this beautiful weather from that awfully cold Washington, <laughs> D.C. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the ambassador. Uh, the ambassador is going to talk about foreign trade and especially the special relationship that the Netherlands has with the United States on trade. So you would think that it's an MGM topic for a Master of Global Management students. But the ambassador also has 30 years, six years of experience in the foreign service of the Netherlands. So in many ways, it's a global affairs and management talk also. The ambassador has been all over the world uh, he is a top-level official. When you're from a country and you're the ambassador to the United States, it's not a trivial position. It's a major position. So he has definitely been honored by the Netherlands to be sent to the United States. I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse. You can answer that question a little later. <laughs> uh, what I would ask you to do is we are live streaming. So the ambassador will make some comments, and he can take questions whenever he feels like it, probably towards the end. I must ask you that you come to one of the microphones that we have to express your question so that the people online can understand the question as well as the response. So the ambassador has interesting, interesting perspectives being across the world, being in various countries, now this is probably his second, third, or maybe even more assignment in some way within the United States. Uh, he's married, has four children. Uh, truly, his mindset is the mindset that we espouse at Thunderbird. It's the global mindset, and it was refreshing to speak to him. Uh, we hope to bring people like this, and we do periodically to talk to us and help us bring us up to speed in an international way. Without further ado, and I ask you to give him a warm Thunderbird welcome, Ambassador Hannah Schuer. Tell me where. On your, what time are we? Okay, uh, okay, we'll right. do here. Can you stand up? Yeah, right. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, as uh, your dean said, my name is Henne, Henne Schuwer. Uh, I'm the ambassador of the Netherlands in Washington. Uh, and I'm here basically because of Sibyl van der Zee who said that I was not allowed to visit Arizona without visiting Thunderbird. And because as a good civil servant, you do what, as you're told, uh, I'm here. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be here. And I'm very happy to discuss, talk with you uh, about a little bit of a, a mix. I want to talk about the economic relations between the United States, Europe, the United States, and the Netherlands. Uh, and I. I think in the end, I want to take it a little bit 
broader uh, and give you my views on, uh, on a number of issues that I think impact greatly on what's happening in the world at the moment, what's happening in international trade. And it's not only international trade. I have been in the Foreign Service since 1978, I can tell you. And I've come to realize that man doesn't live by bread alone. Uh, whatever you do in trade has an enormous impact on other things like security, uh, like the way that you treat other people, like cultural relations, etc. So I want to talk about that concept uh, um, also. Um, when I um, prepared for this talk and when uh, my, my, my people prepared for this talk, we found out that Thunderbird um, was actually a, a military base uh, a long time back. And it was a military base uh, where young pilots uh, were being trained uh, during the Second World War to go to war. Uh, and later on, for, uh, it remained uh, a, a pilot base until it became uh, the university. And that's, that's interesting because actually tomorrow I will be going to Tucson, uh, where still Netherlands pilots are being trained on the F-16. And I can tell you in the future, Dutch pilots will come to this area again to look Air Force Base, and they will be trained on uh, um, the F-35 uh, plane. So you have a, a strong connection, in a way, uh, to the Netherlands. You have a strong international connection, because I see a link between pilots being trained here to go out and fight for their ideals, fight for security, fight for international relation, and a, a management school, a school like Thunderbird, where young people, again, are being trained, luckily this time not to fight, but to go out, I hope, into the world, and I would uh, hope very much that you all will go out into the world, and, and you try to, to build relationships, you try to see uh, what the world is about, and you try to basically spread what you have learned here uh, to other parts uh, of the world. Because I think that the uh, essence of what you should learn here is the necessity of international trade, the necessity of building connections uh, between uh, the rest of the world. And let me talk a bit about uh, the necessity um, of trade here. Um, I come from a country that's a trading country. Uh, the Netherlands has been trading with the rest of the world for centuries. We came here for the first time to this country in 1609. And in 1609, there was a... Uh, the, the East India Company, which was the main trading company in the Netherlands, sent a ship, the Halve Maan, the Half Moon, uh, captained by an Englishman, uh, to the other side of uh, the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, to find a passage to what at that time was their most important possession, which was what is now called Indonesia, and find a way through uh, the United States, to, through America, to that other side of the world. And he thought he had found it when he sailed a river, which is now called the Hudson River, and sort of halfway through his journey, he found out that he was wrong, and he turned, turned around and basically settled uh, in um, Manhattan, uh, what he then called New Amsterdam, what is now New York. At that time, the Netherlands was the richest country in the world. It's hard to imagine, but we were the richest country in the world, and we were the richest country in the world because a number of things, but I think the most important thing was that we were a tolerant country. We were a tolerant country where the countries uh, around us, surrounding us, were not. They were monotheistic, they were, monotheistic, they were, they adhered to one religion and they basically did not accept people who had other ideas, who maybe were of other races and so on. And the Netherlands was the only country in Europe who were willing to accept other people. We accepted uh, the Jews who had to leave Spain and Portugal. We accepted the Protestants 
the Huguenots who uh, had to leave France, we accepted the Quakers who had to leave uh, England, we accepted uh, the Belgians, the Flemish, when their main port, uh, Antwerp, fell to the Spanish forces. And we made, out of all these people, and we made one country, and we used all their skills, all their brains, partly all their money, to build one country. And we basically, I always say, we made tolerance into a business model. And the business model of tolerance made us the richest country in the world because we were accepting of other people. And that time, we were at that time the richest country in the world, 1609, and we settled New York, we settled New Amsterdam. And actually, the nice thing is that if you look at the early stages of New Amsterdam, you'll see exactly the same uh, re 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 reflection of what the Netherlands was. New Amsterdam at that time was 30% Dutch and 70% of other nationality, of other nations, of other races. And I still, still think that you see that re reflected in what New York is still at this time. It is, I think, the most cosmopolitan melting pot in the United States, I think, for many reasons. I still think the capital of the world, uh, it's probably one of the few real global cities in the world. And if you want to be like that, if you want to be the capital of the world, you have to make sure that the world feels welcome and appreciated at your home. And I think that's what New York is. Uh, and that's why it is the seat of the United Nations. That's why New York is what it is. I came here to trade in six and we have been trading with the United States ever since. And to give you some, some, some figures, because they are always um, interesting, we are a very successful trading nation. We export for something like $700 billion a year. Uh, by doing so, we are the second biggest exporter in Europe and the sixth biggest exporter in the world. We are the second biggest agricultural exporter in the world, net, the second biggest. That's for a country um, that, is, that has 17 million people, that uh, is 16,000 uh, square miles, and I've looked it up. That's the size of, and you must know that, Coconino County, which is, I think, one-seventh of Arizona. One-seventh of Arizona is the second biggest agricultural exporter in the world and the sixth biggest exporter overall uh, in the world. And not only are we only 70, uh, 17 million people and 16,000 square miles, for the better part, we are also below sea level. We struggle every day to keep our feet dry, I can tell you. Uh, and that costs us a lot of money, that costs us a lot of expertise, uh, and we manage. And we managed. I think because of those factors, we have been able to become what we are. We are under a threat. Everybody realizes the threat in the Netherlands. Everybody realizes that they have to pull their weight. And everybody realizes that only as a country united, a country together, we can accomplish the feats uh, uh, that we have accomplished uh, in trade. So, uh, it sounds a little bit uh, if I am proud, and uh, that's the way it should sound, because I am proud. Uh, I am proud of what we are doing. I am proud also of our trade relationship with the United States. The United States is the biggest investor in the Netherlands. Figure $723 billion invested in the uh, Netherlands. We are in the top five of the investors in the United States. Figure again, I have to find it. 240, $274 billion invested in the United States. There are 850 Dutch companies who are, uh, who are active uh, in this country. Among them, the biggies that you all know, the big international companies, Royal Dutch Shell, Philips, Unilever, big companies, 
who has a, an enormous footprint uh, in this country, but also very many, many smaller countries. There are, I think, something like 2,000 American companies invested uh, in the Netherlands. They come there because the geographical location of the Netherlands, we are the gateway to Europe, all the big rivers in Europe end or start, whatever you want to uh, look at it, in uh, the Netherlands, we are the gateway uh, to Europe. Uh, we have a business-friendly climate, a business-friendly government. We normally would speak English, and we have a, an interesting schooling system, although I see a number of Dutch people here, Dutch students here uh, in the room, so you can always outdo us, uh, apparently, or you have the will to do a little bit more than only Dutch education, which I can only applaud, uh, by, the, uh, by the way. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I have, this is my third tour in the United States. Uh, I came here for the first time in 1988. Uh, and I came back here for the third time in 2015, this time as ambassador. Um, and I see a market different uh, from 88 to 2015. And I saw a market difference. I was... I had the honor and the privilege to be a spectator, a witness of your uh, presidential election campaign. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I was, I got upset with the presidential election campaign. And I got upset because as a trades person, as a person coming from the Netherlands, I got upset by the way both candidates treated international trade. International trade in the camp presidential campaign became the bogeyman uh, of the international trade. Everything that was wrong with this country was because of international trade. International trade was stealing your job. International trade had made you poor. International trade was bad for your uh, economy. There had to be a stop to international trade. Well, I can tell you for somebody like me as a Dutchman, uh, it was hard to comprehend. I grew up with the notion and with the conviction that international trade, as long as it's free and fair, will help both sides uh, of, the, of the trade, both sides in this case of the transatlantic. And I could, I could show this. I could show it in numbers. And still, in this campaign, uh, there was this strong notion that international trade was bad for the people of the United States. I think your president, your present president, Donald Trump, um, heard NAFTA was the worst trade, do, trade deal ever. Your trade negotiators were absolute amateurs. Uh, he would basically go, walk back everything that had been done and promise the American people um, that by doing so, uh, he would make America um, a better and richer uh, country. And actually, um, he did. Uh, I won't say he made it a bigger and better country, but he walked back a number of things. What did he promise? Uh, he promised uh, to um, withdraw from TPP. He promised to renegotiate NAFTA. He promised um, to um, to eliminate uh, the trade deficit. Um, and uh, he promised, in a way, China. Um, look at those promises. Let's look at those promises again. The United States, within a week of uh, President Trump being inaugurated, uh, uh, out of TPP. And um, left the 11 remaining country a little bit in, I won't say a mess, but uneasy what to do. And they were not the smallest of countries. Those are countries like Mexico, like Canada, like Japan. And actually, those countries did what maybe not everybody accepted, uh, expected. Those countries said, you know what, we'll go on. 
when the United States walks away from TPP, we will continue uh, TPP. And you saw that uh, when there was the Asian meeting in uh, Vietnam, that was basically the, the, the agreement was reached among the 11. And I think it must have been a very awkward moment for the 11 in one room promising each other we will go on, for the United States in another room being excluded from that meeting where they once had been part. And I think in the third room there must have been a Chinese delegation. And deep in my heart, I think the Chinese delegation was delighted. Uh, because where, if you look at TPP as a trade relation uh, across the Pacific, there was, up till that moment, there was one big hole, and that was on the Pacific side, and that hole was China. Now, all of a sudden, there were two holes. There was China, and there was the United States. There was a balance again, and I'm pretty sure that our Chinese friends saw an enormous possibility there with the United States walking away from TPP, where we all thought, and we is the outsiders, that that was a real achievement. Uh, TPP. It was an achievement because in TPP were measures, were agreements on intellectual property. There were agreements on the environment. There, was, there were agreements on investments, etc. Which I think for the first time, basically the other side, the Pacific side, had accepted. And we knew that, that there was a way to go to get it past Congress, but we all thought that with a committed government, that would happen. And I tell you, not a secret, that of course we as Europeans had mixed feelings about that. Mixed feelings meaning it's great that there is an agreement like TPP, but on the other hand, if there is a TPP agreement, we definitely have to have a TTIP agreement because we have to balance this out. We have always had a, a look at uh, President Obama's pivot to Asia uh, as something that was almost inevitable and very understandable, but we always said to each other, it cannot be that the pivot to Asia goes to the detriment to our uh, transatlantic relation. If the Asian partners are offering something to the United States, and they, the United States, has the possibility to bow to the right, to bow to the left, we have to offer something as well. We have to have that balance. Um, happy with the absence of TPP because it is a good agreement and I think it would have benefited world trade as a whole. Plus, I think it for a much more uncertain partner being uh, China who has as a track record, a track record that is definitely different from the United States. You started to renegotiate renege NAFTA. Um, there, there is a valid reason for renegotiating NAFTA. NAFTA is an old agreement, 20, 25 years old. It needs maintenance. It needs intellectual property. It needs the digital number of, let's say, 21st century issues that are not covered in NAFTA. Actually, the funny thing, of course, is that a lot of those issues are being covered in TPP. So while you have the two NAFTA partners, Mexico and Canada, in uh, the NAFTA agreement with the United States, you might be very well served by the TPP, and you could have copy-paste, so to say, a number of things that happened in uh, TPP. In, uh, um, I do not agree with the notion that NAFTA... Um, was detrimental uh, to uh, the U.S. economy. I think that NAFTA furthered, improved the economy of all three NAFTA countries uh, considerably. I think all three countries are better off uh, because of uh, NAFTA. Maybe one a little bit more than the other, but as a whole, I think NAFTA was to the benefit uh, uh, of all uh, three countries. I think that if the negotiations go toward certain, certain issues like uh, intellectual property and so on, I think it would be fine uh, to renegotiate NAFTA. I think it's, um, for me, it's inconceivable uh, 
uh, that a country like Mexico would be a big shift in labor force back from Mexico to, uh, to, to the United, United States. Why should they agree to, uh, to uh, that? So I think that there, if that is the ultimate goal of the NAFTA renegotiation, I think you're in for a, a deadlock and you're in for a, a, a failure of the NAFTA nego negotiation. Deficit has the beauty that it's so simple that even a person like me can understand the trade deficit. Uh, I understand that if you have a negative trade deficit that the other guy is better off. But you cannot negotiate with the rest of the world saying, you know what, the trade deficit should be negotiated away and we should not have any trade deficit with anybody in the world. The trade deficit is also not a simple sum game where the people who has a trade surplus are winners and the people who have a trade surplus are losers. That's not the case. The trade deficit is a, a global balance and the trade deficit you will find uh, with one country you have a trade deficit and with the other you don't. Secondly, the United States has to be very careful that uh, they might and they, they do have a, a, a substantial trade deficit with the rest of the world. On the other hand, they have an enormous surplus in investment. My country invests heavily uh, in, this, in this country. Uh, I, if I talk to my German colleague, he will point out that the biggest BMW factory in the world is in Spartanburg, uh, uh, with more than, I think, 8,000, but I'm not totally sure, but I think 8,000 uh, uh, workers there and is the biggest exporting factory that BMW has. Uh, you are an investment, uh, you're an investment country because you have the universities, you have the talent, you have the know-how, you attract an enormous amount of investment and that balances your trade deficit. Secondly, look at your trade deficit, what it really is. You have two trade relations, you have goods and you have services trade deficit in goods, but you don't have that trade deficit in services. You are a service provider. 80% of your economy is services. You are doing very well. You are a service country more than that you are a producing country. So there is a lot to be said about uh, the trade deficit. Uh, and there's a lot, there's a lot of finesse and there's a lot of more than the simple equation of a trade deficit that should be negotiated away and end up in zero. Uh, not as simple uh, as that. The country with which you have the biggest trade deficit, of course, is China. I think China uh, has a trade surplus of something like more than 300 billion uh, with the United States, and that's enormous. Then there is something interesting about China, and that leads me to a second point also that I would like to make. To make uh, a, of course, you are negotiating with China, and you will find the EU on your side if you're negotiating with China and saying there are unfair trade practices in China. There are, and we know that. Uh, we know that there are unfair trade practices, and I, we know that you have to fight against those unfair trade practices that already from the beginning the president has said there are unfair trade practices and we have to tackle them. And China was a currency manipulator and what have you. The funny thing is that at that moment you see that your relationship with China is not only trade. You happen to have a problem in North Korea and not only you, the whole world has a problem in North Korea. And you happen to realize that for, the, for solving that problem in North Korea, China is probably essential. So you know what? You'll take a step back and you say, for the time being, we will not talk about the trade deficit or we will lay low on the trade deficit. But because we need the Chinese help on 
uh, North Korea. They, they, they have to stop the trade with North Korea. If we want to do sanctions, sanctions against North Korea are useless without Chinese uh, cooperation. I think China constitutes 90% of the, the trade of the outside world uh, uh, with uh, North Korea. So you need China for another point. So you will lay off. That's the other thing that I wanted to say, and then I come to also to uh, the Netherlands. The relationship with of one country with another country, and I said it before, is not it's not by bread alone. It's the relationship with a country is much much more. If you look at the relationship between the Netherlands and the U.S., it's a relationship starting in 1609. It's a relationship that has held for more than four centuries. It's a relationship where the Netherlands financed your revolution by lending the fledgling republic five million guilders. You, the first ambassador to the Netherlands uh, was uh, your later president, uh, Adams. Uh, John Adams, who went to the Netherlands and secured a loan of five million. And actually, both the Netherlands and the United States thought that loan was so interesting that the same country, the Netherlands, financed your Louisiana purchase uh, a couple of uh, years later with a loan of 13 million. It's a relationship with what we call the first salute, the recognition by the Netherlands of the fledgling Republic of the United States. It's a relationship very much with the United States together with Canada liberating the Netherlands. It's the relationship of a war cemetery in Maargraten in Limburg where 8,300 American boys and girls are lying who gave their life for the freedom of our country. And I don't think that you can wash away that relationship with saying, and we have an economic relationship. The, the measure of our relationship for me is as much, if not more, the war cemetery in Maargraten as the cool figures of investment or the cool figures of import and export. That's important. That's important to see that your relationship with other countries are more than just economic relationship. That your relationships with other countries are intertwined relationship between culture, between politics, between membership of NATO or membership of the EU or membership of the OAS or membership of the UN trying to do the best for a global uh, world uh, plus a, a economic relationship. We as a world face an enormous problem. And let me tell you, and some people might uh, Uh, have uh, heard about it. Um, there is a theory at the moment. No, let me put it other way. Um, what's the guy who was the boss of the, the lead singer of the Boomtown Reds? Who knows that? It's an uh, Irish guy. Come on. Who is uh, an Irish guy? He was pro pre bono. Uh, Yes, uh, uh, okay, well, it was an Irish guy who was the lead singer of the Boomtown Reds, was made famous by the song Anarchy in the UK. And I'm Bob betraying Bob Geldof. Bob Geldof. I heard <laughs> Bob Geldof. Yeah, we are betraying our age here. Uh, Bob Geldof, I, was, I listened to a speech of Bob Geldof three years ago in Brussels. And Bob Geldof is now Sir Bob, Bob Geldof. And, uh, and Bob Geldof cares about the world. Uh, and he had a very interesting speech in which he compared Europe, in this case, of the beginning of the 20th century with Europe now. And he argued that Europe at the beginning of the 20th century was a Europe in, tr in turmoil. The Industrial Revolution had just happened, uh, and people felt left out. People couldn't cope anymore, people of a certain each of uh, felt left, uh, left behind. I think that, and he argued, and I agree with him, that we see the same in the 21st century. The, the digital revolution 
has created that same phenomena, and it is compounded by a globalized world. It's compounded by that somebody everywhere, anywhere around the world can see what happened in the other, in the other world and can see the opportunities and the disadvantages that he has, the disadvantage of staying at his own place, the opportunities that might be there at the other side uh, of the world. And that's something I think that we all have to tackle. Uh, we all have to be aware uh, of this problem and we all have to basically find a solution for a generation that does not feel long, no, no longer feels represented and no longer feels a part of uh, a new world. And that's basically where you come in. And that's how I want to end. That's basically uh, where you come in. That's where you come in like the pilots that were trained here at Thunderbird, Thunderbird Airport, as the pilots who went out to bring security, prosperity out into uh, the world. I think it's the task for you all to, from your relative position of comfort, from your position of knowledge, um, to go out and, and build a world that is connected, uh, to build a world uh, where people feel represented, uh, and to build a world, world where I think um, free trade uh, is a precursor for security and for a global, uh, a global world. Uh, I've seen on the little bench uh, a wonderful inscription that is of one of your faculty members, Dr. William Schurz. Borders frequented, frequented by trade seldom need soldiers. Uh, I think that's the essence. That's the essence of uh, an international trade relation. That's the essence of people trading with each other. Uh, and that's the essence of, I think, what you have to learn uh, in this. It's more than trade. It's, it's building a society where because you have an economic interest and you trade with each other, you do not have interest to do, to make war on each other and to uh, enter into a conflict with each other. Because in the end, trade, free trade, not protectionism, but true free trade where you can benefit the both of you is the essence of uh, a peaceful world or is the precursor of a peaceful world very much hope that like the fighters who trained here more than 70 years ago, you would go out and do the same thing to the world like your predecessors did for our world uh, 70 years ago. Thank you very much. I will take questions as long as they are not too difficult, otherwise my, <laughs> my staff will answer them. So first of all, thank you for your coming here, gave us speech. So I have a question. Speaking of a free trade agreement, you mentioned a couple of times your disappointment with the United States withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And also there's a potential for TTIP, which is the United States with uh, Europe. So you say when the United States withdraw this one, do you think China will, will, will join this one or China will create an alternative like regional comprehensive economic, economic, economic develop? Either join or you think they're gonna create alternatives? of the 11 others uh, to, uh, to uh, join. Uh, I think that we have seen already earlier that China is building alt alternatives. It's building alternatives, uh, I think, throughout the world. It's building alternatives in the Silk Route. It's building alter alternatives in the Development Bank, etc. So China is building. China is presenting the strength of China economically 
uh, their cash, uh, let's be honest, might create an alternative. We still, every bank holds his reserves still basically in gold and dollars. Uh, then maybe euros, and uh, with when will banks start holding their reserves in Chinese currency? Uh, there is a, an unknown there, which I don't know, it's, I cannot look into the soul of Xi Jinping or, or whoever, uh, but I think you have to be worried or worried. Let me say one more thing. I think we are at, on the cusp of a very important moment. I think that the world will, in the next 10 years, will change radically. In, in uh, artificial intelligence, the whole development that's going on in California and everywhere around the world uh, will make it a different world in 2030. All right. Okay. That world will need rules and regulation, will need standards. Who is going to set those standards? I think that will be a very important question that we have to ask ourselves. I, of course, say that I would be very comfortable with a world in which we, the Netherlands, the transatlantic relationship, would set those standards, because those are my standards. I would feel comfortable with those standards. But who tells me that we will set those standards and not a, a, an Asian uh, partnership, an Asian partnership built around China. The, the, an Asian partnership built around China will set different standards than a transatlantic uh, partnership. I will not necessarily say they are better or worse, but it's a different, a different world. So I think that at, the, at this moment, where you are at this moment in history, it's very important to make your international relationship and decide all of us, the world after the Second World War, where we make the world. Yeah, we created the IFIS, we created the UN, we created NATO, we created, those are all our Western society institutions. They have ruled the world for 70, 75 years. Let's acknowledge that that world is coming to an end. We have to find an alternative, and we find the alternative by going out, reaching out to other people, and setting up something. And if we don't do it, it's done for us, and I'm not necessarily convinced that that is a better solution. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, first off, thanks so much for coming. It's really great to hear from you. Um, uh, my question is about Russia, uh, because it fascinates me. Um, but uh, I was curious to hear your perspective on how, you know, as a top Dutch diplomat and then also as, um, as an advocate of free trade, how you plan or how many Western powers can try to mitigate um, maybe Russian threats to Western order or you know, Russian threats to NATO. Or is that even a concern? Uh, that we should be that we should be thinking about. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts there. Well, I'm concerned. I, I served for three years as the chief of staff of the Secretary General of, of NATO, and I've I've negotiated with uh, or next to my Secretary General. I've negotiated with the Russians, and it doesn't fill me with a, a large amount of of security or uh, security or hope for uh, the future. Uh, I think that uh, Russia, um, Russia is a, in a way, more a European problem than an American problem. We share the continent with Russia. We border Russia, NATO, so Poland, uh, uh, Ukraine, the Baltic states, they border Russia. We have a much more imminent threat, so to say, of Russia. I am married to a Swedish wife. You don't have to ask the Swedes about Russia, <laughs> because there are Swedish submarines in Swedish, or Russian submarines in Swedish waters looking at the Swedes every day. Uh, you don't ask a, a very peace-loving uh, country like Norway about Russia, because they are bordering Russia, and they are having a lot of trouble on the northern, uh, northern border. So there are two things. I think, A, Russia is not a democracy. Uh, Russia is ruled by, uh, at best, a very small group of people, and at worst, one person. Uh, that makes it unpredictable, um, and that makes it 
in itself a threat. Um, secondly, uh, we have to live with Russia on the continent. Russia has a number of economic assets in which we are interested, first and foremost, energy. Uh, we want to trade with them in those assets. But the key word there is trade. We do not want to, to be in a blackmailed situation where we are dependent on their assets uh, and therefore will have to do what the Russians want. So we have a, a very difficult situation. Trade for a European is done by the European Union, by the European Commission, uh, and we have 28 uh, in a little while after Brexit, we have one less uh, in the European Union. We don't see eye to eye, all of us, towards Russia. You have countries like Greece or the Southern European countries or maybe Hungary and so on who have a different view of Russia than Sweden has of Russia, than the Netherlands have Russia. We have a special issue with Russia on the MH17. It's a, a plane that was shot down uh, over East Ukraine. 196 of my compatriots uh, died in that uh, air crash. And put it in percentage, that's as big a loss for the Netherlands as the Twin Towers was for the United States. We have in the Netherlands, almost everybody has somebody who knows somebody who was on that plane. That's a very important issue for us. We have an issue there. So um, I think that we have a very difficult situation with Russia. I'm not, uh, I want to talk to the Russians, but I'm very suspicious uh, about uh, the Russians. I do not think that they negotiate with good intent uh, under all circumstances. I want to have fair trade with Russia, and I'm not sure I'm getting fair trade with Russia. And I certainly do not want to have a relation where I would be de dependent on Russia, for instance, for my energy. Uh, so that makes my room to maneuver extremely limited. Uh, that also uh, makes it extremely important that our biggest NATO ally, the United States, makes it unequivocally clear that Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which says that an attack on one member of NATO is an attack on all, is sacred and will be adhered to under all circumstances. And unfortunately, the president, the president in his campaign had left some doubt creep in on that on his first appearance at NATO, let some doubt uh, creep in. Uh, he tracked back on that and basically said, this is what I meant. But you know what? If doubt sets in, it is always there. It will take a long time before that doubt has seeped away, and we're not there yet. Okay. Perfect. Um, you have mentioned that as an ambassador, Eddie, much of the relationship between the countries after, at the end of the day, is much more about the relationship in terms of uh, the rule of the law. In my previous experience work with the um, Chamber of Commerce of Brazil and United States, at the end of the day, it was not much about the relationships, it was more about the law. In our previous talk, I mentioned to you that I have worked in the United States Senate, and at the time that President Trump was running for president, was the time that I was there working with the senators, with the le legislations and formulating all of those um, rules, my, I think my question to you is, given um, President Trump's agenda, given the fact that the Netherlands is going to be put in a such position with uh, the withdrawal of the UK from the EU, uh, given the fact that now Latin America is going to call for a huge attention with more than eight elections coming out in 2018, one of them is a big one from Brazil, I want to understand now what is one of the key challenges, or at least what is a key um, vision for the Netherlands to take the next step? Will they really more just step back and uh, stand with its big ally, with its international trade? You mentioned it's big, 700 billion, it's a big number. Mm -hmm. Or will they kind of sort of take another directions and to where? Um. 
maybe you should write a letter to my government. But uh, <laughs> uh, let me tell you what I think. And it, this is my, my opinion, and it's not checked back with my government. Um, we are an, an old and proud nation. And we are a nation that's built on the rule of law. We are, we claim to be, and I think with some reason, to be the legal capital of the world. We have the UN uh, institutions, the legal institutions in The Hague. And that's for a reason, because we have always been the country of international law. And we regret tremendously that uh, we see, or I see at the moment, an attack on the international law and the international order that uh, we have created after the Second World War. Doesn't mean that the order hasn't to be changed, but you do not change the order by walking away from it and saying, I'm no longer part of it. You do not change uh, a Paris Agreement or an agreement on climate change by saying, I'm no longer part of it. If you have a legitimate grievance, you bring it to the body and say, I would like to have a change like this. Uh, we are very much worried that there is a tendency uh, in this administration uh, at the moment by saying, okay, it's my way or the highway. Uh, if you do not agree uh, with me, I will walk away from uh, the Paris Agreement. I will walk away from the agreement on international refugees. I will walk away from parts of the UN system. Um, you don't get the changes that I think are needed by that kind of attitude. And the frustrating thing is that in a number of those issues, we are on the side of the United States. We were on the side of the UK on a number of issues in the EU. We have always been. But the road <coughs> chosen by the UK, chosen being Brexit, is the wrong road. And we, as the Netherlands, are very sorry that that happened because that diminishes our chances to get some changes that we think are necessary to be made in the EU because we are losing a partner and a big and influential partner. So if you ask me what will our attitude be to the United States, two things. The United States is our ally and will always be our ally. Uh, you liberated us, as I said, uh, in the Second World War. We are eternally grateful for that you are still the leader of the free world, period. We would like the United States to be conscientious of the task that they have, and maybe it's not a task that they have chosen, but I think that the world has bestowed on them, and we want them to take up that burden, lead lead like you did after the Second World War, lead like you have been doing since 1940, uh, 40, 45. And if you do not want to lead, then you will have a period of uncertainty. You have a period of even danger, I think, uh, in the world. There will be nations and people who will make use of that vacuum that is then created, and then there will be another leader. But I'm happy with the leader that we are having. That being said, I think that the Netherlands will, in its de desire to see the United States lead, will never trade away a number of values that we hold dear, and those values are very much within uh, what, uh, what we are. We are a country of the rule of law, uh, of a number of values and norms, and we will not compromise on them. And that will be our uh, position. Last question. Hmm. Good afternoon, and once again, your presence is greatly appreciated. Um, my question is, is somewhat in line with what you were just saying, um, and if the United States as an ambassador of the Netherlands who is greatly invested in the United States, if the United States continues on a protectionist and nationalistic type of 
Tredg, do, can you see the Netherlands ever potentially divesting and reinvesting elsewhere? Or is the, the pride with the relationship that we have between the Netherlands and the US too great for that? Well, the government doesn't invest and de-invest. Say it's the Dutch companies who invest and de-invest. And I can tell you that the Dutch companies who have invested in this country are highly successful and are very happy with their investment. So if I would come up, would go up to headquarters in The Hague of Shell and say, well, you know what, we don't like the administration, please disinvest, they will tap their forehead and say, you know what, it's good that you're a civil servant and I'm a businessman. Uh, so uh, that will not, not, not easily happen. Uh, um, I can tell you that the uncertainty uh, that there was, and it is, been alleviated a little bit because now the, 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 the taxes, the, the changes of the tax law have been adopted. But the uncertainty that there was for Dutch companies, and not only for Dutch, but for many companies, have led to holding off on investments. Yes, uh, you're not going to, I think what it, the thing that the businessman dislikes the most is uncertainty. If he invests, he wants to know with a reasonable degree of certainty what will happen with his in investment. And for the last year, that certainty was not available in the United States. So I've seen uh, uh, Dutch companies basically holding off, not disinvesting, but say, you know what, uh, we'll see what happens uh, for the next year, and then we'll take our decision. It's obvious that uh, the companies who are invested in this country after the latest tax uh, re reforms, uh, there are a lot of them who are very happy with uh, the corporate tax, uh, the way the corporate tax had gone because they are American companies. You know what? They don't have to pay 35%. They go for 221. So that is an interesting development for them. The companies who export are much more nervous. There is still a tendency in this country to basically tax uh, exports uh, more or to tax foreign content uh, more also in products that are made in the United States. There are, I'll tell you honestly, there are uh, some perennial issues between the Netherlands and the United States. The Jones Act is one of them. I, I, the Jones Act is an act of more than 100 years old and I think is wildly protectionist and I don't see the use after 100 years of the Jones Act anymore. But okay, we all have those skeletons in our closet and it's very difficult in a democracy where there are different interests to get rid of those acts. But I think we have to call them by their name and realize what they are. They are not doing, they're not good for this country, they're not good for other countries. And, but it's very difficult to get rid of them. Uh, but uh, once again, as a business partner, uh, when, there is, when this administration creates clarity, I think this still is a very uh, attractive. Uh, you have the best universities, you have a young population, uh, you have it all. Uh, you might not have the, the government sometimes that matches your enormous assets, but okay. We don't have uh, either from time to time. That's what happens. Uh, uh, for the long term, this is our ally, uh, and this will be our ally for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. Thank you. Your Excellency, on behalf of the Thunderbird Student Body, we would like to thank you so much for coming today and give you this gift as our token of appreciation and gratitude. Thank you well. Thank you. <laughs> that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we would be remiss if we didn't thank one more person who made today possible, um, Mr. Sieb van der Zee, who is a T-Bird alum. And as you heard the ambassador say, we couldn't ask for a better advocate than somebody who's 
who tells the ambassador, you can't come to Arizona <laughs> without going to Thunderbird. So thank you so much for everything you do for the school and the student body. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the event is over, both for our digital partners and our people in the audience. Have a nice afternoon.